Greetings folks and welcome to Past Planes number 17. We are now into the second batch of planes uh, that passed through my hands in 2019. And the first plane off the list is the unique little Talon, uh, the ZOHD Talon GT. This plane is a keeper for me. It's one of my favourite FPV planes. And there are a few things I really like about it. Probably one of the main things is just the, the, the size of it. It's just one of those planes that are just right, I find. The right size, the right power, the right speed. It can handle uh, windy conditions, which I find myself flying in quite a lot. Good efficiency, so you can get good long flight times. Really good access inside, which is one of the things I love about this plane. Easy access into the battery bay into the, the central part here for setup. I love the way you can break it down easily and there are um, electrical connections through this join here. So you set up your, your transmitters or receivers in the wing and the act of plugging the wing in connects them through into the center bit. Plenty of space for flight control boards in the middle there, easy access too. Same with the tail, you can just undo that and pop the tail off. And that means that uh, you can pull the tail off, pull the wings off, and I can have it sitting in front of me at the computer and play around with INAV flight control boards and uh, you know programming and things like that. Now it's called a Talon, and I don't know what that term really means, but it's basically the, the, the pusher motor right down on the back, V-tail, big long nose. Uh, compared to the, there's another ZOHD, the Nano Talon, which is sort of a, a more playful version of it, smaller. Um, I don't know, a kind of a less serious version of the, of the Talon and probably all based on uh, the Mini Talon uh, or actually the full-size Talon, which is a, a monstrous plane, but this is the Mini Talon version, the original. Uh, this is a you know very, very well-known and well-respected FPV plane with some awkward design aspects, like I've actually put a hatch in the nose so I can get into the nose there rather than having, going to, having to go through the hatch. This is more of a, a basis for building your own plane. Uh, the Talon GT, it's more of a complete product. I really want, like the way it flies, the, uh, the speed, the agility, and the ability to punch through wind uh, and handle wind makes this just uh, a fun plane to fly, I think. You can go places fast, you can fly longish range, and it's just a good FPV experience. It's a good plane for putting cameras on as well, as you've seen in some of the, my uh, little cutaway videos here. Uh, it looks good when you include some of the plane in the view and there are a variety of spots that you can mount the camera on. <laughs> some of the other unique features, you get Metal Gear servos all around, you get little ball joints uh, for all the push rods, or you did, but uh, it looks, oh yeah, ball joints for the aileron push rods there. One thing I didn't like was the the fact that all the uh, control horns are very small, so you didn't have a lot of scope for adjustment. So I put bigger control horns on the tail surfaces there. Uh, I found when I was trying to set up, it up for INAV, I had a lot of trouble because you had too much control in manual and you, it was difficult to reduce it. So the bigger control horns helps with that. Good features like plastic skid plates and you know the strong sort of central bracing for the, everything to connect into. These little finlets at the back uh, are a bit prone to damage, but um, I've taped them up and they've survived pretty well. Their protection along the leading edge of the wing there. Uh, one thing I don't like so much is the nose. I, I never actually put the cameras inside the nose because where I fly, <coughs> it's always going to uh, scoop up dirt and grass and coat the lens of the, of the camera. So I always put my FPV cameras and HD cameras up on the top of the nose there. So. This nose isn't a lot of use to me. In fact, what I'm going to try is um, sort of put a fairing in there and see if that increases the efficiency even more, just for a bit of less, less of a blunt nose. That's a test for the future. Some people have said uh, when you load it up with, with a lot of batteries and it's heavy, it um, tends to torque roll a lot more on launch. I haven't done that myself. I keep my planes reasonably light, light as possible. Uh, and I don't usually have any problems with torque roll that I'm aware of anyway. Apart from the expense, it is 
one of the most expensive planes that I have. Uh, but yeah, you can see a lot, there's a lot of design work and a lot of good gear has gone into these things. Uh, it is made from BEPP foam, which is supposed to be more biodegradable than normal. Doesn't really make all that much difference. Uh, the foam can be a little bit weak, it's pretty well reinforced in there. The, the uh, previous, the Dart XL, uh, wasn't as well reinforced in the nose, so that tended to break when you bonked the nose in. But um, yeah, overall, just a, one of those planes that is just right, I think. Well designed. All right, next plane up is the unique little E Sky Eagles. It's an 1100mm wingspan uh, pusher plane with some really really nice design features it had an all-flying elevator which means the the whole elevator surface uh, pivots for uh, pitch control it had all the push rods internal in the uh, tail boom uh, so they're all hidden and out of the way it had some of the best landing gear i've seen on any plane really uh, they were really nice useful uh, big or medium-sized bush wheel i suppose with sturdy supports and a steerable nose wheel as well. It had kind of a small and high revving quad motor, which might have been a downside, I suppose. Came with quite a noisy three-bladed prop, and I think most of us have changed it to a, a two-bladed prop. <laughs> the wings uh, bolt on the top, and there's space underneath the wings for flight control boards and other FPV gear. Has a big, chunky uh, nose, it can run on a variety of batteries from 1300, 2200 up to 4000 3S battery in the nose. One of the problems was there's a lot of wasted space in the fuselage. Because of that steerable nose wheel, there had to be a, a servo to, to uh, operate that. And also the tail servos came up into the fuselage area as well. So although it was a nice big chunky uh, main body part of the fuselage, a lot of the space was unusable. Space under the wing allowed you to put a flight control board in there, but I found it a real pain to get the wing on and off. They're sort of long uh, thumb screws, uh, and you know, you end up that took a lot of screwing, and you end up bruising your fingers getting, getting the wing on and off. My flying weight with a 2200 3S was 765 grams, so it was a good weight. Had nice amount of wing area, sort of a deep cord, uh, square profile wings, I suppose, with some slight dihedral. The landing gear could be easily removed. The, the uh, mid, mid wheels and supports could just click in and out and the nose wheel was just a, a screw to hold it in there. So you could uh, fly it without the landing gear for good efficiency. It was quite efficient as it was actually. You could get a 20 minute flight time out of a 2200 3S battery, which was pretty good. One of the downsides was that the foam was a little bit soft. It was sort of, uh, you kept leaving finger dents in it. It wasn't really tough foam. It was stiff enough. It was sort of nicely designed. It had good flying characteristics. It flew well, very well without any bad habits at all. From memory, it took a little bit of time to get off the ground. It needed a bit of a run up. But as you can see, I haven't got it in my hand. I didn't keep it. And uh, although at the same time, I was kind of looking at the Ranger G2 here, and I thought that the two sort of filled the same gap, although the E-Sky Eagles was much more refined and had the landing gear and, and everything like that. Uh, and the Ranger G2 was, um, I don't know, a bit more basic, I suppose. But the thing about the Ranger D2, G2 is there's a lot more accessible space in the nose here for bigger batteries, for flight control boards, and just easy access, whereas the E-Sky didn't really have that. In all my flight comparisons, I actually preferred the E-Sky Eagles, but I decided not to keep it, and the Ranger D G2 is the one that I kept. Uh, I, I kind of consider these sorts of planes as um, test beds for flight control boards and FPV gear, and I just thought that the Ranger G2 was a, a more convenient and, and better at doing that sort of thing. But as I said, I really enjoyed flying the E-Sky Eagles. It was a great plane to put cameras on. It looked great in the sky, easy to fly, fun to land, fun to take off. And although it does have all the, the fancy things like full flying elevator and internal push rods um, and you know internal servos, I still prefer to have accessible servos down on the tail like we have on the Ranger G2 and the simplicity. The Ranger G2 also has this sort of higher mount point for the motor so you can put a, a 
bigger mo a, a bigger prop on and have a, a slower revving motor for even more efficiency. But basically the Eastkai Eagles is a really nice plane and if you're thinking of buying one I, I would certainly recommend it. Okay, next up, uh, I'm going to talk about my box planes or the cardboard planes made from the boxes of all these other planes that get sent to me. And I'm building these box planes, these cardboard planes, just for the fun of it, basically, because you you know you can do a real quick and dirty build in a day and, and have it flying. But also, uh, just to show how easy, as long as you get the basics correct, you can make just about anything fly, use just about any sort of building materials. As long as you get the center of gravity right, it's not too heavy, you get the thrust angle right and controls right, then you should be able to get it to fly nicely. A lot of the designs draw heavily on flight test style folded wings and they're not designed to last for any length of time at all. In fact, some of them only last one day or a couple of flights or a, you know, a flight, an adjustment, then another flight. And you know, that's, they live their, live their usefulness out basically. Uh, but yeah, just a lot of fun and people seem to really enjoy watching them too. First one I did was the flight test pizza box style wing, um, which is a great design. If you go to flight test, you can download the plans and you just basically get a big piece of cardboard and fold it up into this wing shape and it flies beautifully, kind of based on the uh, mini arrow style wing, maybe a little bit deeper in between the Versa wing and the mini arrow, I suppose. That one I made from the Ranger G2 box, which is a nice cardboard, it's thin and it's got a sort of shiny print on one side, which makes it nice and stiff and a really good material for making these box planes out of. So that was a real surprise because that flew very, very nicely indeed. They're always such a surprise. You can hear it in my voice, you know, I'm giggling away and uh, can't believe that they actually fly. So that one was very nice. If you're thinking of trying a cardboard plane, I would definitely start with that one. After that, uh, we had the MG BGT, uh, which wasn't so good. That was lower quality cardboard, wasn't as strong. That came from the MG800 box, which I'll be talking about very soon. Tried to make that one a three channel plane with sort of separate elevator and uh, rudder. Uh, it, it flew okay, but uh, it just wasn't very good. And you know, a, a badly uh, laid out three channel plane is, is pretty terrible to fly. It sort of wafts around up and down and all over the place. So not that impressed with that one. That one sort of had just a cardboard profile. It didn't have a, uh, you know, a tubular fuselage, so it lacked a bit of strength in that way. Next up, we tried uh, the Brusler, which was based on Bruce Simpson's uh, sub 250 gram FPV plane design. The initial design of that, I had just sort of short straight wings and it was too twitchy. So then I added some little dihedral tips on the end of it, more wing area, a little bit more stability from the angled up wing tips and um, that worked very well. It's very good because the the sort of the twin rudders form part of the tail boom I suppose so you get a lot of directional stability. Very very easy build and I would, I would recommend that one too. Even look up Bruce's uh, design and, and follow that one. After that came the the cardboard canard plane which is based on the Ansley Peace drone or, or sort of my uh, tweak of that with a central fin and uh, elevator on the front. And also on this one, I used a triangular fuselage, which adds so much strength. It's just the simplest and strongest way to, to build a fuselage tube. So, and I found that both of the planes that I used that triangular tube, it, they flew the best of all of them. With these canard style planes, I've found a little bit that uh, you can lose some elevator authority when you hook into a turn. So it's not for flying in tight spaces where you might have to duck away from trees and things like that. It's really a cruiser, so you need to have space to turn in case it sort of starts dropping and you haven't got enough uh, elevator authority to quickly get out of that, that dip in the turn. Next up came the best of the lot, which the, was the Nano Talon or the Box Talon, uh, made from the box of the Nano Talon Evo. And again, this had the triangular fuselage, nice big wing area, um, nice big cord, uh, V-tail, and this is by far the best cardboard plane I've flew. It, it just flew like a, a really nicely designed little plane. And I think a lot of it's due to the actual plan form of the Talon. Uh, and it just suited the, the weight and the stiffness of the, of the cardboard that I used in that one. So definitely uh, have a go at that one if you want to try a cardboard plane. It's uh, very successful, that one. I really liked it. Next up was the uh, Box Dart made from the, I think it was the Mini Talon box, possibly. Can't really remember. 
Uh, I had a fair bit of trouble with that one. Like the Canard Plains, I had very little elevator or pitch authority uh, when you were in a turn. I had to play with the thrust angle and increase the size of the control surfaces and eventually got that flying quite nicely. But it was a little bit more prob problematic than the other ones. I think it took a, quite a few attempts to get that one flying nicely. And finally we come to the Box Lattice, which is the plane I made to represent the Pilatus PC9. And that was really good. It was, it was quite twitchy, uh, like an aerobatic plane, I suppose, because it had short, straight, uh, bottom-mounted wings. You kind of expect it. The actual Pilatus has some dihedral in the bottom-mounted wings, so uh, this plane could have benefit, benefited from that, but would have made the build a lot more complex. But yeah, the basic style of build for that one worked quite well, as long as you as long as you could keep on the controls uh, because you just couldn't couldn't take your eye off it, you couldn't let go of the controls for a minute, otherwise it would do its own thing. But yep, flew nice and direct and uh, acrobatic and uh, kind of a success that one. But as I said, the best of the lot is the, uh, the mini Talon or the nano Talon style of plane. Uh, easy, kind of easy to build and very, very successful. And finally, for this episode of Past Planes, we have the little MG800, which was a surprisingly good little plane built from EPP. It was kind of basic, but really rugged, very, very simple. Had a basic square profile wing with quite a decent airfoil on it, so had wide uh, performance window. Uh, 440 grams, 1300.3S, had a uh, 8x6 prop, so a pretty decent performance really. It would lift off the ground very, very quickly. Uh, so good STOL properties. The wings were very flexy. It really, really needed a spar and I eventually did put a spar in it to stiffen it up. Uh, although they were tough enough to, to handle the flex, they weren't going to break. It was, you know, thick EPP. Landing gear that worked okay on a decent uh, runway. It was just bank and yank, so no rudder, just ailerons and elevator and flew perfectly well like that. You had to pull the wing off to um, get access into the battery bay and the insides, uh, but that was fine. Uh, it was pretty easy. They had a little uh, rubber band tie down sort of setup, and it was just a fun plane to fly. Could take off in the width of a cricket pitch, which is uh, what a meter and a half or something like that, and um, fly around in tight circles. You know, you could flip loops and do rolls and things like that. Very responsive, very nimble. I had a <laughs> bit of a surprise on my maiden. My throttle got stuck somehow, um, even though I had throttle cut and my throttle was working fine on the radio, the, the plane just uh, went full throttle and kept on flying for a little while, which is quite scary. Either it was radio interference, uh, ESC problem, I'm not too sure, I never really got to the bottom of that, I just changed out all the gear because <laughs> that was quite, quite frightening. I thought I was going to have to land at full throttle for a while, uh, but yeah, it eventually click back in and um, throttle drop down and I could actually land it properly. So unpretentious, basic and honest and tough. Just needed a spar in the wing. And it was just a, a fun, nimble and tough little park flyer really. Gave it away to a friend who uh, loves flying it now. So if you're looking at one of them, definitely. Maybe put your own gear in it. Maybe remember you're going to have to put a spar in the wing if you don't want that flex. But uh, yep, I'd recommend that one. Okay, so that's it for Pass Plane 17. I'll continue on in a couple of weeks. I'll put up another Pass Planes episode. Stay positive, look after yourself. Thanks for watching.